Hi, this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre, and we're once again recording at Nutmeg with our engineer Frank Verderosa. We talk a lot about Renaissance men on this show, but our guest today truly fits the bill. He's a musician, songwriter, record producer, pop singer, novelist, screenwriter, and Tony-winning dramatist, and composer of numerous Broadway productions, including Curtain's Accomplice, Say Goodnight Gracie, A Time to Kill, and The Mystery of Edwin Drood. He's a two-time winner of the prestigious Edgar Award for Best Mystery Writing, And his 2003 novel, Where the Truth Lies, was adopted into a major motion picture starring Colin Firth and Kevin Bacon. You want more? Okay. He also created, wrote, scored the most loved and critically acclaimed AMC comedy drama series, Remember When. His original songs have been performed by and recorded by artists such as Betty Buckley, Blake Shelton, Dolly Parton, Judy Collins, Dionne Warwick, Britney Spears, Barry Manilow, Barbara Streisand. He also arranged and conducted songs for Streisand's classic 1975 album, Lazy Afternoon, as well as five other albums, and contributed songs to the hit 1976 film, A Star Is Born. Yet, despite his many achievements, he's probably still best known as the singer-songwriter of several Billboard Top 10 singles, including him and the number one platinum hit, Escape, also known as the Pina Colada Song. Please welcome an artist the LA Times called an American treasure, the first person in theater history to win Tony Awards as an author, composer, and lyricist. And, as far as we know, the only man to ever write a hit song about cannibalism. (laughs) Rupert Holmes. After that, after that intro, I, I just keep thinking of people listening and saying, wow, this is going to be amazing. I wonder who it is. I wonder who it is. And now you say Rupert Holmes, and they're saying, I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't know. People know. Is. Our fans are hardcore. <laughs> now, now we got to get to the most important part of the yes, interview indeed. first. <laughs> I, 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 I'm sure we know where now, this is. Now, Rupert Holmes, yeah. uh, is uh, that that sounds like it's not your real name. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it? It yeah. does. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we changed my name because of all the... Um, uh, my father's name was uh, Leonard Goldstein, and we ch- he changed his name because of all the anti-Christian fervor in the United <laughs> States in the 50s. A lot of that. There was so much of that going around. No, actually, you know, it's it's kind of an odd story. I, I My mother was British. My father was an atheist Jew. I was raised as an Episcopalian altar boy. And they used to say assisting at the uh, at the baptismal ceremony is David Goldstein. And they people would say they're really? getting in everywhere. They're getting in everywhere. <laughs> There's just no keeping them out. You know, and um, and when I, I was I I got into the record business, uh, which is where how I that was my first door that I entered uh, the entertainment business. I, when I got in, if your name was Dave Goldstein, uh, they would say, "Hi, Dave, how are you? What's your name going to be? What, what will you?" What will <laughs> right you, away. Uh, you know, I worked with Danny Jordan, who was Jerry Florio. I worked with you know, just everyone just automatically. Uh, Bob Dylan was Bob Zimmerman, as you know. That's right. Uh, Carol King was uh, Carol Klein. That's right. Uh, you just change your name. And uh, and also, I was born in England, and it was still pretty cool in the 60s to be sort of British. I didn't have a British accent, but but uh, I thought I want to graft myself onto something British. And I, that wasn't actually the first. I was in the business for an entire year. The business didn't know I was in the business, but I was in the business. As David Goldstein? No, I was oh. in the business as Julian Gill, which really has some connection to me. Julian is my middle name, and Gill was my aunt's name. So I, I tried to do legitimate. And then a publisher I worked for who paid me $50 a week for every song I would ever write um, I, I left him and he took out ads in the trades, Record World and Billboard and Cashbox, saying, do not take the songs by David Goldstein, a.k.a. Julian Gill. And I was I was screwed. 
So I had to come up with yet another name, and I thought, okay, well, let's see. I got to get something British like Julian Rupert. I don't think there are any Ruperts at that time. And then I thought, well, last name uh, Home. I love Sherlock Holmes. I love thought, Sherlock I Holmes. thought so. So I thought I'll graft myself onto his family tree, and and that was it. Could have been Mycroft. Yeah, Mycroft <laughs> would have been good. Mycroft <laughs> and. And before uh, we walked into the recording area, yes, sir. Both of us got into a conversation about Son of Dracula. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I heard. I thought I heard John Carradine's name mentioned yes. when the door opened. Yes, to indeed. Yes, indeed. You, you, um, you were mentioning that. Uh, can I? Am I allowed to say the go, context go right ahead. about about yes. uh, you were? Well, I'm. You know, I heard this story six minutes ago. You know it. Uh, Why yes. don't you tell the story? Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, my wife wanted to na- give our son a middle name with an A in it. Cause, oh, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> and so my idea was it should be Alucard. <laughs> and it took me just a moment to remember that that is That's actually right. the name. Uh, I love this premise, by the way. It was in a movie called Son of Dracula, made in the 40s with Lon Chaney Jr. as a rather kind of overweight vampire. <laughs> He That's was, his favorite actor, he, Rupert. Be I, careful. I, I, yes. Fighting Watch those, Jr.? Those fighting yes. words. Oh, he loves the them. The Indestructible Man. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. The Indestructible Man. That's a great film. Oh, yeah. yes. Um, I, th- I think that The Indestructible Man is the earliest horror movie I remember seeing. Yeah. And it has wow. an actor who goes by two names. Oh, I, I Kate, know it. I know it. I know one name is Max uh, Oh, Showalter. Max Showalter, Max Showalter, also known right. as Casey Adams. Adams. Yes. We've yes. talked about him on this well, show. I think with his real name, Max Showalter, sounded too German. Yeah. So he changed it. He became Casey Adams. And he wound up, uh, one of the last things he did was 16 Candles with did Molly he really? Ringwald. Yeah, yeah he, he was one. in Niagara. He That's was in the movie Niagara right. with Marilyn Monroe. Right. And, and it, the funny thing good. is, later on, he developed like, to be a funny comic actor. Yeah, he was really good at that. And but in that, he looks like such a great C dramatic yeah, actor. Yeah, yeah. He but, was. He he. he um, uh, by the way, we're not talking at all about me. I, 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 how <laughs> hey, how has this happened? Well, you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> we're talking about Montini <laughs> Jr. Okay, movies. Uh, let me finish the Alucard. <laughs> what I love about Alucard <laughs> is that in the movie, Dracula decides to go to. You know, the, the logical place he would go to, which is New Orleans. Sure. You know, because it's... <laughs> of course. For the Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras fan. And, uh, and he decides to disguise his name in a way that no one will ever be able to figure out. So he calls himself Count Alucard, as if no one would ever, like, <laughs> hold his name up to a mirror and yeah. see it's Dracula backwards, right? See, but at least, like, John Carradine... Well, he was lean and hungry in all his movies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But... but he was uh, Baron Latos in right. House, of, House Frankenstein of Frankenstein and House of Dracula. Gilbert, House you're good. Dracula. He was Baron Latos. J. Carol Nash was in that as well. Ah, uh, yes. He was the hunchback Daniel. Right, yeah. Sad. And then, you yeah, know, those were interesting. Those last two films, House of Dracula and House of Frankenstein, are really kind of fun. They try to get every monster oh, in. Oh, yeah. And then they didn't know what to do, so Abin, they brought Abbott and Costello in as well. And but, Abbott and Costello did it much better. Much better. It was actually kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah. We had a lady named uh, Janet Ann Gallo on this podcast. Does that mean anything to you? I, it probably will when you. It sounds familiar. I, I don't. I, can't I place was. It. I was the one screaming. He for wanted. Janet. He wanted her on this show desperately. We tracked her down. She was a child star. She has. She hasn't acted what in sixty years. Ah, uh, so, yeah. So, something she like that. She was in uh, Ghost of Frankenstein Ghost with of Lon Chaney Jr. Jr. and Beta Lugosi and 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 Glenn Strange is the monster. Uh, no, or no, that's no. that's Wolf uh, that's uh, meets the, the Wolf Man. Yeah, yeah. Lon, uh, Lon Chaney. Chaney was the, the Chaney monster. was the monster. Oh, that's, Lon Chaney was the monster. That's yeah, right, yeah. Ghost of. Yeah, right. And yeah. she's the little girl who befriends the monster. Wow. There's no and other podcast. her down. We did? Yes. No other podcast in the world would have Janet Ann Gallo on the show and a lengthy discussion about Max Showalter. <laughs> and, <laughs> this and is the one. quality broadcasting, <laughs> you know? This is the one, buddy. And not to ruin the surprise, but we've been talking to Donnie Donegan. Who was you know the- him? <laughs> I, you're going to tell me and I'm going to know. He was the I- voice of Bambi, for one thing. Yes. And he was, the, but- he was Basil Rathbone's son. In, oh, in, that's uh, where I know Son it. of Frankenstein. Yeah. Son of Frankenstein. Yeah. We did, right. We did Lionel Atwill. That's it. Lionel Atwill. Very yeah. good. 
Young Frankenstein is really, I think, a, a particular homage to the second to Son of Frankenstein more than to any other Frankenstein yeah, film. Well, yeah, well, the Kenneth Morris character is yeah. just li- that's, Lionel that's Atwell, right, Lionel right, Atwell right there. personified. Yeah. So, Gilbert's thrilled that you're Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I've never been bar mitzvahed. I'm sorry. Neither yeah. was he. No. no, I wasn't either. Really? But but I I my feeling is is uh, no I I don't know when the holidays are. I eat pork, uh, blah, blah, blah. But I know if the Nazis come back. You're a guy. Yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll be in the train car with everyone absolutely, else. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you're in the UK. You come from a, a, fa- a musical family, too, we should point out. Your yes. brother's an opera singer. My brother is an opera singer at the me- Met for some 55 years now. Yeah. And I 50, find it interesting in not doing, 55, 50. doing research. And your dad, obviously. My dad was amazing. He was a. He was a um, Try to imagine this. At 19, he was lead alto in the big band era for a wonderful big band uh, led by Red Norvo. And my second novel, Swing, taps a lot of that Mm -hmm. period. Uh, Then uh, he was also a Juilliard graduate and taught at the Juilliard. So he was a jazz musician, classical conductor and musician, led his own infantry division band during World War II and then came back here. Um, with family in tow when I was three and became head of auditions for NBC Radio. And I have early memories of walking around uh, the RCA building at that at that time. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And didn't and, he have some kind of a city job or something? A, a city job? You mean in the city? That would be have been a city job. No, no. Like some kind of job like... Um, Oh, I forget what they said he was. It he was, was a, he was a, a teacher for the rest of yes. his life, and he became superintendent of uh, music uh, for the Nyack Public School System up the river, which is sort of where I grew up. And uh, and of all the things he did, that ended up being for him the most rewarding. It meant the most to him. So it was, it, it, originally, you thought about becoming a classical music, a musician. I, I went mean, to that's, Manhattan that's, School of Music. Right, that's where you were headed. I was. I went to Man, first. I went to Syracuse for a year, and I went into the town and said, "Can you direct me to the city proper?" And they said, "You're standing on it," uh, because my idea of a city was New York City. Uh, I missed New York a lot, so I transferred after my first year at Syracuse to back to. Uh, Manhattan School of Music, where I was uh, changed my major from clarinet. I was a pretty good clarinetist. I got into colleges on mm-hmm. that and changed it to music theory. But I wanted very badly to be in the pop music business. You and, also wanted to be a storyteller. Well, the only way I could do both, I figured, because I didn't, I, I knew no one in theater at that time, but I had long hair and I could play a guitar and could play a piano and I could write music, which most people at that time couldn't do. And I, um, I figured if I write story songs, I I can be a storyteller in three minutes and and make the records into little mini movies. And so I thought the way to be able to uh, have my cake and eat it too, which is not actually a bad goal if you're in the cake market. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want to eat that. Um, is uh, is would be to be a, a pop storyteller in song. And uh, and that's sort of what I worked my way for years to get to. Speaking of of, of pop songs and cake, yes, Jimmy Webb, yes, revealed no, I left to it him. out, left it out there. Yeah, yeah he, did. he was in he that chair. Totally <laughs> revealed to us, because all this time I thought he's such a poet, right? It's so <laughs> symbolic of something, and and he said he actually was in the park once. It was raining. And there was some piece of cake lying on the <laughs> ground. And that was the whole thing. Yeah. I thought he was such a brilliant... Are you disillusioned? Dog. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> he took the mystery out of it? Yeah. So we, it's funny that you, that you bring up story songs, too, because it's kind of a dying art, storytelling in song or yeah. story songs. I mean, but we it, talked about things like the night the, the lights went out in Georgia. We were oh, talking about pop songs that, two, on two this show. Two singers, uh, one... Uh, you know, Taxi. Oh, Harry Chapin. Harry mm-hmm. Chapin. Sure, sure. And the other one, Badly Roy Brown. Oh, Jim Croce. Uh, yeah. Both of those guys, they were always song. Mm-hmm. I mean, always stories. Right, yeah. Ode to Billy Joe. That's another one. one. Well, even something one. like Piano Man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, the story song, I think, has, is, is, has sought refuge in uh, country music. Uh, if you look at the charts, you will still see situational songs. Right. Some of them are really well thought out with interest. You know, um, he stopped loving her today. Okay. Uh, which uh, the payoff is he stopped loving her today because he died, and that was the only thing that was ever going to. But you don't learn that right away. So I've blown it for a lot of people. It's been around. 
Um, now you've ruined this song. Ruined this song for everyone. Yeah. For, yeah. But um, uh, it's a wonderful form. It's a wonderful, uh, you, it's a lot of pressure. When I, um, when Joe Papp said to me, when I presented the idea for my first musical, The Mystery of Edwin Drew, Tim, he said, he knew my songs. Right. And he was the one who sort of encouraged me to try and write a musical. And he said, but who's going to write the book? And I said, meaning the script, other than the tunes. And I said, well, I thought I would. And he said, can, can you do that? I said, I've been having to tell stories for 10 years now in three minutes sure. that rhyme, have a twist ending and a fade out. Right. I said, writing where I don't have to rhyme, that, that should be pretty a, 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 a nice break from that. So um, it's, a, it's a fun craft. It's a, a lot of pressure, though, because a lot of my songs, you have to do the whole song in two verses, a chorus, and another well, Like verse. Terminal was a story. Terminal, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Down the aisle of the bus And you sat by my side Shoulder up to shoulder We shared that nine o'clock ride Oh, my heart was screaming As you left your seat Following your movements I was at your feet And oh down into the terminal, both of us fly. So we entered the terminal just as you smile. And now, now this is very important. You wrote a song that was later made into a movie where you claim. That Martin and Lewis. Oh, a book. A book that yeah. was turned into a movie. Yeah. yeah. You claim that Martin and Lewis used to fuck each other up the ass. Yes. You know, it's um, it's not exactly that. Not, <laughs> not, a, not by a long shot. Not by a long shot. <laughs> And 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 if and if it were, I would find the fact that I worked with Jerry Lewis. One of the great thrills of my career is that I Childhood got to hero. Work, uh, absolutely. Um, and I got to do a musical with Marvin Hamlish. It was the last musical Marvin wrote. Um, uh, I did uh, the book and the lyrics. Marvin did the music, and we did a musical of the Nutty Professor with Jerry overseeing the entire production. And uh, I got to be. Um, buddies with my boyhood hero because oh, when i was wow. growing up when i was growing up but pre beatles the two coolest people in the world to be were martin and lewis mm -hmm. there, there was no and, one cool and they said they were as big if not bigger than the beatles yeah. that well day. they they had the screaming crowds outside the paramount uh, theater and uh, and they were and i remember when someone came up to me on the playground field on the blacktop and said uh, dean and jerry are breaking up and that was like, until the Kennedy assassination, that was the hardest news I had heard. Really? It was devastating to us. We, we just thought, because it, it was, again, what you loved about the Beatles was this sense, an illusion, but a sense that there are these four guys, there's no one leader of the group, there's no front man, and they're buddies. And when they're not making this great music, they hang out together. And, and that just is so appealing. And you just had the feeling that Martin and Lewis would just always... Be hanging out and having, yeah. it, and and suddenly to find out that this Damon and Pythias relationship was splintered, um, it just felt really weird. And we, should, we should fill in for our listeners too the the book where the movie was made with Kevin Bacon and Colin Firth. People know the movie. Yeah, the it was based on your book, but but you've said it's purely fictional. Oh, absolutely. You basically just you were you were intrigued with what the I, idea of a comedy yeah. team and what I what I tried to base it on was the idea that no one really ever gave a proper account to the public back in that time as to why these two people who own the world and were seemingly inseparable suddenly wanted to have nothing to do with each other. So I concocted a story about a, a similar duo, uh, Vince Collins and Lanny Morris, who inexplicably split up. Uh, and there's a, 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 a woman who was found in a hotel in New Jersey. And that's the center. It's something to do with this woman that's found dead in a bathtub in a New Jersey hotel. And and it's about a, a, a female reporter in the 70s who tries to unravel this mystery. And um, what you alluded to earlier, <laughs> the, the, the really savory part of it, is is not exactly – there is no implication that the two of the – even my two characters um, were – there's an episode that happens in their lives. And you'd have to read it. I'd give away too much otherwise. And now, I mean, I, I too – Grew up as a Jerry Lewis fan. Sure. 
Uh, but the stories that I always hear is that Jerry Lewis, when you get to know him, much like the Nutty Professor, is a Jekyll and Hyde character. Um, I, I haven't seen uh, Mr. Hyde in action. Uh, I, re- I see things on the news. I see interviews he does um, where he seems strangely bitter at times. Um, uh, he, we liked each other, and I think, I think also he feels very safe because he knows I adore him, and I can cite every single thing he's ever done in a movie. And I want, not just the movies. I'm, I'm much older than you are, uh, Gilbert, but, I mean, I grew up on the Colgate Comedy Hour, and they did some of the most amazing sketches. And, and I pay, even within the novel, I mentioned that if you ever took what they were doing as an act and analyzed it on a piece of paper, there's nothing there. It's just these two guys winging back and forth and uh, and taking heroic pratfalls, which left him very injured. Yeah. Um, um, but um, I, 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 he was a, a joy to work with from my point of view and everything I would want the Jerry Lewis I grew up with to be. I'm glad it worked out because they say don't meet your heroes because sometimes it backfires. I but kn- in this case— I had a chance to meet John Lennon uh-huh. and I didn't want to do it. Well, wow. Tell because, us. No, I— I just I had an opportunity. I met Paul McCartney. I did not meet John Lennon. I just thought so highly of him that I knew that if he said something or didn't have time or brushed me off or said something snide, oh. I would think, oh, and there goes all that work that I love, and it's going to be. I'm always going to have that little dark. So thing. you per- you purposely yeah. avoided me. It was him. too perfect. Wow. Was I also it? had the chance to meet Cary Grant, and I didn't. Wow. Who was it who was on the show? Had a horrible story about John. It was Lennon. Howard Kalin of the Turtles? Yeah. Had a story about, he said about that John. Oh, John, just about John mistreating somebody in his band. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But you know, he was a flawed man. And and you had a chance to meet Cary Grant uh, just for an afternoon yeah. uh, when I was out in L.A. And then someone, uh, the PR person who was promoting my first album, her friend was actually uh, living with him and uh, wanting to have a ch- marry him. And he's saying, "No, you don't want to get married." And this is towards the end of his life. And uh, she was going to drive us over and. Say hi to Cary Grant, and I thought I can't, don't I, I can't do that. I can't go there. I just I want my the greatest <laughs> so the greatest role Cary Grant ever played was Cary Grant yes. inventing who he was and what he was, and I I just didn't want to ever see him drop character. Oh yeah, you want to see you want to know that in real life he's in black and white. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. What's that thing you say that you you be, you belong in the room, but but still there's that you know you belong there. You have the right to be there, but still there's that kid inside you when yeah, you meet I, these people? Uh, 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 yes. I, I always I, – I was once at a um, Columbia 30th anniversary party, and uh, I went with Barbara Streisand, and at the table was Barbara Streisand, uh, Frank Capra. Wow. Um, John Houston, um, Charles Bronson, George Siegel, Groucho Marx, and me. Holy <laughs> and shit. I thought – that's the great. caption for this is "Circle who does not belong at this table." You know? <laughs> I've been at some of that, those tables. Is, yeah. That is absolutely yeah. doesn't seem the, like it the, could exist. The only sad thing was that it was Groucho was really not there. Oh, you yeah. know, that's he too showed bad. up. And what year are we talking about? We're talking roughly? about seventy-five. You were working with Barbara. I was and working she with Barbara Streisand. I I was recording an album called "Lazy Afternoon," which right. I wrote and arranged and conducted. And we were working, moving towards working on "A Star Is Born," and. Um, and uh, I got to go with her to this dinner, and I just looked around and thought, what do I do? How do I? Yeah. Oh, I'm in the business, too, Mr. Capra. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know how you know how it is for wordsmiths. You know? <laughs> um, so we have to ask, did you engage with, with Capra and John Houston? And I did. You know, I've there? actually found people to be, yeah, they, as long as you don't try to presume too much, like say, yeah, it's kind of like when a chiropractor will say to me, um, uh, you know, we're both really in the same business. And I'll say, no. no. <laughs> dentist. Dentist. Huh? Dentist huh? will say, I, I'd love to. Dentist will say, just before the, they say, I'd love to, I'd love to write a novel too. I just don't have the time. I just don't have the time. I think, yeah, it's, that's all that's preventing. Uh, Orson Welles. I got to, like, chat. I was going to bring that one up. With Orson Welles, yeah. yeah. How did that come about? Well, uh, it, I actually saw him a number of times and, and, and got to lunch with him, but... Um, uh, but the first time was uh, so silly. So I was on the Merv Griffin show. I did a lot of those shows in the 70s. And, uh, and he had preceded me. And, uh, and, 
And by the way, if you want to know the scariest words to ever hear in your life, it's to hear Merv Griffin say, well, we'd love to chat more with Orson Welles, but now let's meet Rupert Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe uh, maybe great. the most blood chilling words I've ever heard. <laughs> anyway, I'm so Merv's on at the desk. Uh, I'm next to him, and Orson has moved over to make way for me to the to my right, and and so I'm sitting between Merv and Orson Welles. And it's sort of like being t- between a rock and a soft place, you know, and and uh, <laughs> and and the soft place being you know Merv, and um, and. I start to do an interview with Merv, and the questions I'm a- the answers to the questions that I'm giving, I can hear televisions turning off all over America. <laughs> you know, every everything I'm saying is only to try in some way to impress Orson Welles. Right. You know? Sure. And <laughs> somehow, wouldn't. somehow, I don't know. We're talking about the Pina Colada song, and the Magnificent Ambersons comes into the conversation. You know, and my bringing it in there, and and finally, I'm I'm talking about I'm talking about authors, and I say, uh, well, as G.K. Chesterton said, and da, 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 I'm quoting people, and they would go to commercial, and Orson Welles leans over and he says, you know, it, it does my heart good to your young man like yourself, uh, quoting G.K. Chesterton, you know. Um, H.G. Wells once told me that G.K. Chesterton said, and I'm thinking, so I'm hearing Orson Wells <laughs> tell me what H.G. Wells oh, God. told wow. me about, about you. And, and so we were fast friends. He did a, <clears throat> a magic trick on the show, and it involved lighting flash paper, and um, he lit it with a match from a box of matches that said Rosebud on it. Oh, oh man. my and I, God. I took it. And on the next commercial break, I said, I've never done this. Could you autograph this matchbook for me? So he drew a little drawing for me and wrote congratulations and all like that. And we ended up, for some reason, getting booked on, on that show a lot and um, got to talk about things. I once asked him, he was always in black in those days. Mm-hmm, sure. And, and I said, do you design your own suits? And he said, that would be like having an architect for a tent. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. Wow. Anyway, they were very voluminous. Yeah, stories. sure. Yeah. We had Bogdanovich on the show telling us some Morrison stories. He's not only – I was going to write a, a, a play. I met with him a lot to, to – uh-huh. we were going to do a play about his life. And then there were certain parts of his life he simply didn't want to get into, which was fine with me but not fine with the producers who were funding uh-huh. it. But he is a remarkable impressionist he, of – Oh, he his, is. He can go in and out of Alfred Hitchcock. He surprised Karen us. Grant. Did he, he do it, it here on the show? Yeah, he oh, did yeah. a killer Walter Brennan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he surprised us. We also learned that one of Orson Welles' favorite shows was Kojak. For real? Yes. Wow. Yeah, that made me happy. Wow. it's just Because it's just completely random. <laughs> wow. The Night Stalker, he... he, he the, oh, Kojak, not Kojak. Co- not Kolchak. Kolchak. Oh, Kojak. Yeah, yeah that, would have been, that would have been cool. Even better, right? <laughs> yeah, Co- yeah, Kojak. Yeah. Darren McGavin's always been my favorite actor. You like um, Darren McGavin? Well, I actually do. Yeah. I actually do. He was Mike I, Hammer on TV in the I, early 50s. I, I remember one time seeing Darren McGavin... At the Friars Club in New York in a bathrobe, <laughs> asking me if I knew how to turn on the TV with a remote. For, he and, probably yeah. came from the steam room. He probably yeah, Yes, yes. That yes. may explain some aspect it, of it, that so we don't picture him quite as much of a bag man as we... Yeah, like, it depressed me. Did yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. I, used to, I used to chat up Dennis Farina in the steam room at the Friars really? Club. Really? Also a lovely guy. A, he, a raconteur. I've heard people tell yeah, me about a, him and a, say he was really nice. A sweet fella. So I'm going all the way back since I told you we jump around. Yes, And indeed. there's no rhyme or reason to this. That's right. You, you, you come that from... Martin and Lewis you so <laughs> like to fuck each other. No. And no. He, you got to read the book. <laughs> you got to read the book. It's all explained three chapters and, from the end. And, you know, I saw the movie... And when I think of a crazy Jew comic, I think Kevin Bacon. I know. Listen, <laughs> can I tell you, two, I just want to say about that movie. He's incorrigible. Me, no, but let me say about those two guys in particular. Yes. That, that um, I, this is not one, this is one of those glib disclaimers. I had nothing to do with the with the film. Mm-hmm. I didn't get to, when I, I met with the fellow who had optioned it, who was an award winning director, wonderful director named Adam Agoyan. Mm-hmm. And he said to me, we had a dinner at the some some place and he said, Now you know I um I, I do write all my own screenplays. And I said, Well it's my first novel and I thought in my mind the good thing is that it, when you when your novel is made into a movie, 
what you can always kind of figure out is the, rash, uh, the, the cover story on that is if they do it good, then they captured your brilliant novel. And if they do it lousy, then they screwed your beautiful novel, you know. Um, so I went along with that and I had nothing to do with the film. The film was made under a, um, a, a tax deal where the entire cast had to be either British or Canadian except for one actor. Uh, Kevin Bacon, who's such a great guy, wonderful great guy, and he does a great job, but he's not trying to be Jerry Lewis yeah. in the movie. Um, he was the sole American. Colin Firth was is suave and, and again, couldn't have been nicer to me. And he actually autographed my novel saying, I think this is a case where I am going to have novel envy as the actor in the movie. That's that very wishing, nice. Wishing I could... And uh, and he was wonderful, but he's not Dean Martin. And then Alison Lohman, uh, who played the girl in it, is, uh, is as American as can be, but she happened to be born in Canada. And everyone else is from Canada or England. Uh, so it was not maybe – it isn't as if someone said we want two actors, any two actors in the world to play – these characters, it was kind of from a limited pool of people who were either British or could be the one American to be in the film. Wow. Yeah. It's a hilarious story, and I have many yes. more like it. And, <laughs> and, and this this story was that Martin and Lewis used to blow Yeah, yeah it's exactly. No. Yeah. No, that was never it. Never <laughs> it. You should read the book. <laughs> yeah. You were going back somewhere. You were saying going back. I'm going back. back. Yeah. Yes. yeah, because I want to talk about things like you working with the Jackson 5 and also the part writing a song for the Partridge family yeah. and all of that cool stuff. What, part of the, the, the fun thing I found in the research is you saying that you would have done anything to get into the music business, and you did. I did almost everything. I didn't do Some what genius. Martin did to Lewis. No. But... <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> See how he put that together, Gil? It's this circular little that circular nice. there, Jack Benny running gag number three. That was nice. So, but um, you wrote you wrote jingles and you did. I, I you, said yes to everything, and you know what? If you, I was, comp I had no way into the music business, and so my, um, I was eighteen, and my philosophy was just say yes to everything, be exploited, let people take advantage of you. Um, Somewhere you will find a niche, some opening that you can get through and get one toe in. Much like Martin and Lewis. <laughs> yes, sorry. So, so um, the um, so uh, like in the first year of my career, I did the marching band arrangement of Oya Um I did the high school band arrangement, the most thankless job in the world. You got to write like. 48 p parts, do all your own copying, and you get $300. Did the concert band arrangement of ha selections from hair. I did the piano vocal folio for the Charlie Pride songbook, Did You Think I found to that. Pray? Wasn't there a Frosty the Snowman job? I did a marching band arrangement of Frosty the Snowman. You try to think, how many people are marching in... in, in... <laughs> <laughs> I don't, and I, up I also did Jingle Bells Rock. Well, if you're going to find yourself in the snow, I guess the Lane Parade or whatever it is in, in L.A. or something, you could do it. Um, uh, but I did every job, and, and people found that I was willing to arrange songs for $15 or things. So I did everything. And my first job in the business, <clears throat> um, there was a, an actual job and not just me doing things for people. Uh, about a year in, I got a job at Lou Levy Music, a guy who would uh, – Run Leeds Music, sold and then opened a new company, and I was a uh, the cop. I was a combination uh, uh, errand boy and songwriter, okay. and I and I got fifty dollars a week. And I later learned that if I had only been the errand boy, I would have gotten seventy a week. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and he and Lou said to me, "Got this act uh, that someone is pushing, and uh, um, go to the Apollo Theater." And, and check them out and see if they're any good because you're the only you're the you're the future of this country, which was bad news for this country. Um, you're, I was the only person under fifty in the in the company because um, he used to hire writers who wrote lyrics like "Yasvenska Flicka," "You Affect My Ticka," "Me with a Geisha Playing Pisha Pesha." <laughs> That's for you, Gil. Nim fed or matron, let me be your patron, Miss Yugoslavia. How I'd love to love you. <laughs> And this, that wasn't me. Those aren't my lyrics. That, those were lyrics written by one of the great lyricists of all time uh, who wrote the song tenderly. But anyway, uh, he said to me, go to the Apollo Theater because you're the only one who would even dare go up there. And I went to the Apollo Theater and saw the opening act on a 15-act bill. When you're the opening act at the Apollo Theater, 
um, you are only that much above being the person who sells popcorn in the lobby. It's the lowest, you know, that's mm-hmm. it. And it was this family called the Jackson family. And there was this boy who was five and a half or six, and it was Michael Jackson. Incredible. And I came back and said, this is just... Didn't he stand on your shoes? He walk? did later. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm getting, uh. he, he said, he said, I said, I think they have incredible potential. He said, you go out there, I'll pay. You go to Gary, Indiana and visit them. It's all set up with their manager who had them. They had a record on a label called Steel Town, not Motown, Steel Town. And, um, and so I flew out to Gary, Indiana, checked into a Holiday Inn there, went to their home. They weren't home. Asked around. I went to the south side of Chicago where they were performing. I saw Joe Jackson. We made an appointment. I came back the next day, came to their home, and I spent three days in the home of the Jackson family. And Michael Jackson was doing that thing that kids do, as you mentioned, where um, they they put their feet on your feet, and then you have to walk around the room with the, them walking on your feet. And um, and they were terrific. And I taught, I think, Jermaine. I taught him how to play bar chords. And my thought was that they could maybe do some um, – contemporary versions of some young standards. And I got back to New York. Most of your listeners won't know what I'm referring to here, but but I said, Mr. Levy, I, I think they're willing to sign a recording contract if you'll pay for it. And he said, we're going to have them redo all the Ink Spots hits, which was, you know, kind of even then as Uncle Tom as it could get. And so that never happened. But I did get to meet Michael Jackson and work with him. And I even then thought, I wonder what kind of childhood he's going to have because he was already... Just he was an incredible performer even at that age. Wow. And that was when I was like, I don't know, 19. You were also, as a teenager, you were you were conducting. You were working with people like the Platters and Gene Pitney. Yeah. You when were I, conducting and arranging at, yeah. at, at that tender age? Yeah. I was um, – um, uh, the the good gigs like Gene Pitney, that didn't come till I was about 19. Uh, and I was attending Manhattan School of Music and my teachers would sometimes be on my sessions. And they would, at the end of the session, say, well, sure, hope you'll think of me again sometime. I'm thinking, you gave me a D yesterday, <laughs> and, and, I, and you're on my session. Gene Pitney was a ter- I remember in 1969, everything was going right with the world. The Mets looked like they might win the pennant. Uh-huh. And I was doing Gene Pitney recording sessions and, pl- uh, the, and sessions with the Drifters and the Platters and, um, and with strings. And I even started getting paid for some of this. You know, and, so. and Gene Pitney. One of your favorites. Uh, yes. And maybe we can sing this together if we both know the words. Which one? Town Without Pity. Uh, I, I, if I could do the keyboard part for you, I can't do it. So you'll have to do it alone. We don't have a fucking keyboard. <laughs> <here>. <laughs> do, to, but sing an acapella. Okay. Come on. <laughs> When we stop to gaze upon a star, people talk about how bad we are. How can anything survive? How can we keep love alive when these little minds break us in two? No, it isn't very pretty. What a town without pity can do. <laughs> and, What's look, your verdict, Rupert? It's uh, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you were crying. I was, I was. I'm just looking. I'm fumbling for my my handkerchief. It's just, <laughs> a tear. That's He's you know. A tear. <laughs> and you know, if only he could have been here to hear you sing. <laughs> it would have meant so much to him, Gilbert. And you know, I'm not saying you sounded exactly like him, <laughs> but but and yet, in your own way, you captured him. Yeah. Um, he was. He, he was, gets the range of the song. Yeah. If not gets, the, yeah. 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 Um, and um, um, he was a cool guy. Um, he. Uh, God bless him. Uh, did I just? That's a showbiz thing. I just. God bless. So, God bless him. You should only have a. So um, he invested his money unlike any other like rock star of that period not rocks a pop star um in uh, i think i think i talked with him at the time that he had put a lot of his money into apartment buildings in europe and he was doing just fine and he didn't need the gig to be recording and what i loved he the only guy who would have done this in the late 60s he showed up for his recording session in a, a a three-piece suit you know with a vest nice snug vest and a tie a knotted tie and when he did the session and sang he never un- loosened the tie he never took wow. off the jacket nice old school he never took off the vest he 
was just and uh, uh, he, th- that was uh, he was a class act. He was a real class act. The song, one of the songs on the session he was recording was a clear all hair. Was it? She uh, lets her hair down. She lets her hair down. She walks barefoot through the meadows early in the morning. Early in the morning. And we did another one called "Where uh, All the Young Women, which was kind of a poor man's uh, Where Have All the Flowers Gone. And he sang the first line and he went, um, All the young women, where are they going? Where are they going? And the producer, who was thick, said, uh, Gene, you're saying where are they going? Uh, it's where are they going? And Gene said, oh, okay. He sang it again. He went, All the young women... Where were they going? <laughs> he said, Gene, Gene, you keep saying, where were they going? It's where are they going? You're saying it in a silly way. And Gene goes, oh, okay. And he takes a pencil and he makes a note on the lyric sheet that he's holding. And he goes, all the young women, where were they going? Never changed. It's, it came out that way. But I like that he made the note yeah. Yeah. with the pencil. He took direction. <laughs> yeah. I think well, if we ever get Paul Schaefer back on the show, and we should, he's got a Gene Pitney story. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, it, oh, what did you write for Barry Manilow? I wrote a song that I think One of my Barry, favorites. Well, yeah, he's actually done it on two live albums. It's on the, it's on the first live album, yeah, and yeah. it's on the one in London as well. Yeah. Um, it's kind of interesting because I don't know if he knew its derivation. Um, it's a song called "Studio Musician," and it's about the all the brilliant musicians that we heard on records back in the sixties and seventies. These were people who were masters of their craft, and they would show up for a three-hour session, sometimes 60 with a half hour, and they would be geniuses on a record, and um, y- you would never know their name. So like uh, on, uh, on um, uh, You Keep Me Hanging On, not by Vanilla Fudge, but the original record, some guy came in and went, da 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 and we don't know who that is. Or uh, there's a guy, Sal Detroya. Who knows his name? And he he played dun 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 ba boom 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 ba boom. Everybody's talking at me. He's the guy who came in, saw C major written on the chord. He could have played anything he wanted, and he went dun ba 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 dun, which became a lick that suddenly showed up in in gasoline commercials. And he was the one who played it. And almost every hit record had somebody doing something that was amazing, and it was just a guy who was showing or a woman who was showing up and getting $60 yeah. for the gig, and the record would be a hit, and that was an integral part of it, and you would never know who they two, were. Two documentaries come to mind, uh, Standing in the Shadows of Motown. Yeah. You get to see who some of those people are, and also the Wrecking Crew documentary, Oh yeah, the recent one, which is great. Yeah. I mean, let people know who Carol Kay and, and Hal Blaine are. They don't know all of them. Yeah. Tedesco, and, they know the bigger names. And but. these people, guys like that, I... You know, they thought that's eh, a job. Yeah, they, not, actually, they weren't geniuses. They didn't think of themselves as geniuses. They were. They were pretty amazing. Yeah, and, and uh, um, I, I got to work with Carol and uh, and Hal Blaine out in the West Coast in my first, my very first professional recording session. I was doing an album. With Doctor Ben Casey, with Vince, Vince Edwards. Edwards. Oh, Vince, wow. Vince Edwards grew up with my dad. Did he really? He did. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Here in in, in New, New York. York. Now, yeah, now you know the story Brooklyn here kid. of uh, Ben Casey, don't you? No. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you clean it up? Was no, it him no. and Martin and Lewis? Was yeah. It... <laughs> yeah. Oh no, but he no, no. did. He was. He did walk out. On an episode of Ben K- Ben Casey that Jerry Lewis was directing. Really? I never knew that story. Yeah, That's he, good stuff. He got pissed off at Jerry Lewis. Wow. Vinny Edwards drove to California with my dad. Really? Wow. For a future show. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> Played the title <laughs> role in a film called Mr. Universe. Yes, indeed. But years later, Jerry Lewis said in some article that he, he really understood why Vince Edwards got pissed off and... And he said that Vince Edwards was a fine actor, yeah. and so he was actually nice about it. Yeah. I got to I got to do an album with him when uh, this was I, uh, very just after I left Lou Levy. I got a job at a at a, a record company on the on the Sunset Strip, and he was the first artist where I went into a studio and recorded ten songs with union musicians and mm-hmm. my arrangements on the stand and. Uh, and it was great. And I uh, got back to New York uh, thinking this was the beginning of my future. And uh, the union in L.A. said, uh, these checks for the – we've got your checks for the Vince Edwards sessions, you as the arranger, uh, but we can't send them to you because you owe dues on them. And I said, well, just take the dues out. They said, we can't take the dues out. They're checks. They've got to be deposited. Uh, so you sent us a check for the dues on the checks. 
And, uh, and you know, I lived in a studio apartment for like $95 a month. And they said, send us the dues, 10%, and we'll send you the checks. So I sent them the dues and couldn't wait for the checks to come in. And all the checks bounced. And they represent, and the record company that I was working for went out of business. And I was not only out the money that I had earned uh, on the West Coast, but out the dues that I had mailed them as well. So I had to kind of restart my career. Then when I think of Vince Edwards, actually, I think you, about that. You think, <laughs> you think of that. <laughs> ben Casey and Dr. Zorba. Dr. Zorba. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, Sam Jaffe. Yeah, Sam you bet. Jaffe. Yeah. Dunga Din. Yeah. We had Ron Dante on the show a couple of weeks ago, Amazing. your old uh, your old colleagues. So Absolutely. T- tell us how that came about. Tell us about how you came to work for the Cufflinks and uh, well, it Vance and Pockris. Yeah, it, yeah. I yeah. were the one of the first people to really exploit me to the hill. And <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Ron too. Yeah, safe yeah. Well, to say. no, Ron was no. Ron was good. Ron uh, was a good guy. Um, no, I mean them exploiting oh, oh, him yeah. as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Except yeah. Ron got like beat up once or had a fight. Over well, a I, all I know fight. is we brought the name up and, and the, the show went silent for a minute. <laughs> well, I don't have to <laughs> be may have to edit that out. <laughs> I, worked for, I, I worked for a man named Paul Vance who, to his credit, wrote Catch a Falling Star and put it in your pocket. Still with us. Right. And yes, he is still yes. with us. Um, and uh, on the other side, on the not so to his credit, he wrote um, Leader of the Laundromat by the Detergents. Which was a parody of right. Leader yes. of the Pack. Well, that was Ron. And that was Ron. Yeah. And to, uh, Tommy Wynn and Danny Jordan, who I mentioned earlier, who actually got me into the business. That's how I met Paul. And um, and uh, he wrote uh, Playground in My Mind by another oh, host, Clint Oh, sure, Holmes. sure. Anyway, in these days, I, I once overheard Paul talking on the phone to somebody. And he says, I got this kid working for me right now. He says, I pay him 30 bucks a song. He writes the song with me. He puts down the chords. And he sometimes works on, 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 the, on the melody. He says he writes the lead sheet for copyright purposes. He does the arrangement and he does all his own copying. He doesn't – I don't pay for copying. He writes, <laughs> he writes out the parts. Then if I want him to sing the lead and be a mythical group, a non-existent group, he sings the lead. If I don't have him sing the lead or if I do, he sings all the backup vocals. And then if need be, I, I, he, we have a milk crate at Mercury Studios and he stomps his feet on the milk crate <laughs> four to a bar to make it sound like a Four Seasons record. And I pay him 30 bucks a song. And in the hallway hearing this, I thought, he's paying me 30 bucks a song and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> wow. Meaning I, I'm getting the greatest education in the world. That's great. I finally, along this lines, and, and it was Paul who did the Gene Pitney session I was referring to. Um, Ron Dante is the only guy, I'm sure you this came up, who had two records. Of course. In the top five yep. in the same week, and no one in America knew who Tracy he was. Tracy and it Sugar. Was Tracy and as Sugar. the Cufflinks, right. number four, and Sugar Sugar by the Archies. You bet. Right. And I arranged... I didn't have – I had nothing to do – I wish I had something to do with Tracy. But I arranged uh, – I did the orchestral arrangements on the rest of the first Cufflinks album. And I worked on that whole album with Ron. And Ron was magic. He would come in, couldn't really read music. Um, and one time he sang a lyric. He was singing, put a little love in your heart. And he sang, we want the world to know we won't let hat red glow. Put a little, I said, what? What do you sing? He says, we want the world to know we won't let hat red glow. And I looked at my lead sheet that I'd written. I said, hat, red glow? I said, Ron, that's, we won't let hatred grow. We <laughs> Hat hyphen red. It's not hatred. It's hat hatred, not hat red. Anyway, when Ron had a, came to a, 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 bumped heads with Paul, who was a tough guy, when he needed to be, um, and he seemed to always want to be, uh, when they bumped heads, Ron wouldn't do any more Cufflinks records. So as had happened a couple of other times, um, I had to become the Cufflinks at right. that point. So I then did the second Cufflinks album, doing all the vocals for now getting maybe 40 bucks a song and uh, <laughs> and all the string charts and, all, and playing piano on the dates and conducting the session. The, the one thing I want to share with you is that a couple blocks from here, there used to be a place called the 69 Cent Store. And, oh, uh, Gilbert, you would have been in your glory. Oh, God, I remember. <laughs> yeah. I remember when they were the 69 cent store. Yeah, they're looking to the future. <laughs> right? Yes. I, oh, my God. When him? I was growing up, yeah. the 69 cent store. Well, I used to go it was the, amazing. Yeah, and I used to go there to buy all classical albums by on labels you've never heard of uh, recorded in Budapest and so I could get all the classical music I like for 69 cents a shot mm-hmm. and um, but they never had cassettes or eight tracks there one day I see a bin 
and they're selling cassettes at the 69 cent store. I think this is fantastic. And I go over to the bin and I look down and it's that second Cufflinks album that I'm the lead singer on, full of that thing. And the payoff is that there's a sign above the bin and it says two for 69. <laughs> <laughs> See, if, really? I, if I found that album in a, in, a, in, a, in a store, not even a 69 cent store, yeah. any store, I'd be very excited. Yeah, yeah. well, I was, yeah. I, I was thrilled, but, um, and, and we got onto, oh yeah, Ron Dante, and then I, that's how I became the Cufflinks for a while. Right, the Cufflinks. And I became a lot of other groups. And what was, what really turned things around for me was that Epic Records, seeing that I was doing all these records as n- groups that didn't exist. What you did is you recorded a, a song that someone thought would be a hit. You put a name on the record saying it was a group, the Moccasins. Sure. Uh, uh, well, Tony uh, Burroughs was the, the king of that, with yeah. White Plains and, uh, what was it? Uh, Great uh, records. Edison, Founda- Edison, Edison Lighthouse, Lighthouse and, and Foundation. Right, and, right. Yeah, all that the stuff. The one that did, uh, what's the, what was that novelty song they did, too? Uh, I'm trying to think of it. Anyway. Uh, give Me That Ding. Give Me That Ding. Give Me yeah. That Ding. Oh, yeah. geez. Yeah, yeah. all yes. the same yeah. people. Yeah. And it was all the same, you know. And sometimes we'd do five songs, and, and he Paul would make a deal to sell five different groups to five labels. And if the record didn't do anything, so goodbye to that group. But if it became a hit, then it was, uh, they had to actually form a real cufflinks at one point because they were doing well enough to be on TV, but it didn't have Ron Dante or me in it. And they showed up to do a show called Music Scene, which was on against Laughing. And, um, and they said, the record doesn't sound like the record. Oh, well, the lead singers quit and all like that. But, Epic Records wanted me to be one of those, to do a, a group, a non-existent group for them, writing my own stuff, not with Paul Vance, just on my own, and with a fellow named Jeffrey Lesser. So I had this deal to do four non-existent groups, and it was going to be for a group that was going to be called Rosebud. And I made this one song called Terminal. And I thought when I went into the, the session, you better record something you actually care about soon because it's wonderful that you're getting into the business and making connections, but you, you've got, you, you haven't made a record that you actually believe in. It's always been someone else's idea of what would be a hit. And um, so I, rec- I wrote this song called Terminal, which was a good song. One of my and, favorites of yours. Oh, and it's on the first record, widescreen. Thank you, on right. widescreen, yeah, right. Yeah. You brought and, it back. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, and uh, the label heard it, and they said, uh, we don't want to put this out as a mythical group. We want to put this out as you. And I said, uh, great, but I've always promised myself that if I was going to use my own name, put my name on the record, and it's me, and I live or die by that, um, it would have to be on an album. It couldn't be just a 45. And they said, we don't know about that. We're not ready to make that kind of commitment. To we and I just said, i got to play tough on this. And about a week later, they called and they said, all right, all right, all right. We'll put out an album that you can do and we'll give you $45,000 to make the album and, uh, and it'll be you on our label. And I made this album called Widescreen and I put everything I'd ever wanted to say in a song on it. And, and each cut had a different oh, yeah. orchestra. It's ambitious. I, it was very ambitious. And we spent every penny and then some of the budget. And the people who said, okay, you can make the album, had left Epic by the time that the album was ready to be released. So I was on a label that had no idea why I was on it. And it was a critical success. It was got some amazing reviews and top 10 of the year and stuff, but no one heard it. And if you, they only print 10,000 copies, you're not even in the running for failure. Well, somebody important heard it. Right, yeah. And somehow, and there's a story in that too, but somehow uh, a copy of it got to Barbara Streisand. And I had this amazing day in my life where Barbara Streisand got on the phone with me and said, hi, I've listened to your album and I like these songs and I see you do your own arrangements. I'd like to record some and maybe you should fly out and do the arrangements for me. And and uh, I thought it was the worst Barbara Streisand impression I'd ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't sound anything like her, not even funny at all, you know. And uh, it wasn't really until I got a, a first-class airplane ticket to fly to L.A. that I actually began to let myself buy into the fact that it wasn't one of the most elaborate pranks in, of all time. There's a great and, line where you say, go ahead, Gil. Oh, no, I was just going to say, because you hear another person, you hear bad stories about. What was Barbara Streisand like to work with? Well, I, again, she was. she went out on a limb. To pick me. I wasn't the choice of the label. The label didn't say, we've got this new wunderkind for you to work with. She said to the label, to Columbia, I- I'm going to work. My next album is going to be done by this guy. 
and he's going to and and she sort of went made a commitment to that. Um, she couldn't have been more gracious to me. The first session we did together at uh, it was a, happened to be at Capitol Recording Studios because that was the only studio we could book. Uh, she handed me a little note that said, "Rupert, don't be frightened. You're the best." That's nice. And uh, and and she was uh, really amazing. She is also uh, demands a lot from herself and expects everybody to be on that level. Like you, Gil. <laughs> uh, I felt so bad. I didn't know that we were going to all be in tux, and Gilbert's in tux. Yeah, he's got a cover yeah, bond yeah. on. And I, I just wore a casual outfit. There's a great line where you were sitting, I guess you were sitting in her house, and she was putting on your record, and you said to yourself, so this is what it's like when your life changes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the first day I actually met her in person, she picked me up. She was driving a, a, a Mercedes where you could smell the leather from two blocks away. It was so new. <laughs> right. And, uh, and she picked me up uh, because, like Gilbert, I do not drive. So it's like, <laughs> I I'd, love love that. To, I'd, love to, I'd love to meet you, uh, Barbara, but uh, can you pick me up because I don't drive? Right? It's a great way to start a relationship, oh, yeah. right? And uh, she picked me up and she said, before we go to start rehearsing some songs, uh, I've got to see a rough cut of Funny Lady um, over at the uh, 20th Century Fox lot because it's it's not a 20th a Fox film, but my man, uh, Ray uh, Stark has his office on the Fox lot. So um, she drives there, and to get to this particular screening room where she's going to see the rough cut of the sequel to Funny Girl, uh, we have to drive under the New York elevated subway set from Hello, Dolly!, Wow. So I say, okay, so let's see. Let's take inventory here. Uh, I'm uh, being chauffeured by Barbara Streisand in a convertible driving under the set of Hello, Dolly! to go see a screening. And, you know, like two nights ago, um, it was, should I supersize that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Things change fast in a Very fast. So Very I fast. want to recommend to our listeners is the, the songs you wrote on that album, uh, My Father's Song, is beautiful. Thank you. And also letters that cross in the mail. Story song. Very, yeah. very. Uh, a story song. Yeah. There you go. Very much so. Yeah, beautiful. And Thank you me. wrote one for her, um, for, for A Star is Born with our, with our friend, Mr. Williams? Um, well. Paul has done this show? Uh, yes. Um, I, I've i often, I've turned to Paul. I don't think he'll mind me repeating this, but I said to him, do you remember that great night back uh, when we were over at uh, Patty Farrell's house and we were having dinner and you said to me, and he said, Does this, he said, did this happen in the 70s? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't remember. <laughs> he says, because I, I don't remember anything of the 70s. And this was the 70s. Um, what happened actually, uh, how can I tell this very quickly? Um, I had written a number of songs for the movie. And one for of a the, Star is Born. For a Star is Born, yeah. right. Uh, this is after I finished Lazy Afternoon, which had four of my tunes on it. And then I'm writing some more. And I wrote the first two sing- songs she actually sings in the movie, a song called Queen Bee. That's right. And another song called Everything. And... Um, and I had a fight with John Peters. It's the only fight I've ever had in show business. I, it was chemically, we just, John Peters was the uh, yes. hairdresser who became the, sort of the role model for shampoo, the movie sure. shampoo, sure. who became a producer. And um, they're just, we, it was, hello, glycerin, meet nitro. You know, it was like, um, and we had a kind of fight, which is not anything that I ever do. And, uh at one point, he was chasing after me around a desk, and luckily the desk was circular. I'd be dead. <laughs> uh, we were able to do that, and he was chasing after And the executive uh, producer for First Artist said to him, John, you're the producer of a $6 million musical. You can't kill him. And I... <laughs> And I thought, thank God it wasn't a $3 million yeah, musical. Yeah. Then it would have been loss of one arm and right. an eye, you know. And I ran around that table, and I left the building, and I went to the airport, and I flew home. And I never came back. And this song that I had written called Everything, they decided it needed another verse. And, uh, and Paul at that time was now writing the songs. And so he wrote an additional verse for the song. Oh, okay. And 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 you're so, credited as co-writers yeah, on they, the song. Yeah, the split is um, I get eighty and he gets twenty, and the split was based entirely on height. <laughs> That's a great line. I want to learn what life is for. I don't want much. I just want more. And I will sing I want everything 
Williams told the story around stories. that time period. He has period. great stories. Oh, he is. He's a great... and, and he said he was doing a TV show and, and Michael Caine was there. And he went over to Michael Caine and said, you know, I just want you to know what an honor it is. You're just such a great man. And I, I look forward my whole life to meeting you. <laughs> and Michael Caine said... Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> you stayed at my house for a month. <laughs> oh, I can believe that. Oh, oh, I can believe that. We've had Paul's been on this show, and then we've had other guests come on with their Paul Williams stories. Really? Yeah. 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 Jimmy Webb had a few choice ones too. <laughs> sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Tell we we put it in the intro uh, about uh, Timothy. Yeah, and you have to tell Gil- Gilbert is fascinated, and he, you know I'm surprised you don't know this song because we've done the, about cannibal. Well, yes, yeah. we we did we do a <laughs> we, we do a one hit wonders little mini show, sure, and, sure. and we we yeah. we, we mentioned Timothy, and he wasn't familiar with the song, the pop song can, about cannibals. Can you sing some of this? Sure, I, I, I will sing it to you if I uh, do. I have time to tell you yeah, the story. Of yes. course, okay. So, uh, and I will sing it to you in the course of of telling you this story. <laughs> and, and by the way, it's something to really look forward to. <laughs> Um, so, so I'm, it's funny. I get a lot of heat about the song Timothy, which I again wrote like in 1968 when I was, knew no one in the business. And, um, uh, and actually as time has gone by, um, I'm very proud of that 19 year old guy that I was. Um, and I have to give him credit, um, for being a, a tale that somehow managed to wag a dog. And um, here's the story. Um, I I made a friend in one of my early demo sessions of a, a, a nice uh, guy uh, named Michael Wright who was an engineer, junior engineer, at Scepter Recording Studios at 254 West 54th Street on the fourth floor where Dionne Warwick uh, recorded uh, a lot of her hits. And he was like the junior engineer. And as a kind of reward for the kind of terrible salary they paid people like that, uh, they let him have the keys to the studio for the weekend. Anytime he wanted to come in and make a record, as long as he didn't damage anything, if he wanted to bring in a group and he would be the engineer so no one else had to be hired, um, he, would, he would do that. And he um, got, asked me if I'd like to work with him on the weekend. So every weekend of my life for about a year, I was at Scepter Studios recording all kinds of things, most of it unlistenable, but just <laughs> learning how, what is this? It gets louder when you do that. I see when you move it forward. And um, and uh, he finally found a band called The Buoys, uh-huh. B-U-O-Y-S, yep. out of Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And they were actually talented kids, especially the lead singer had a great voice named Bill Kelly. And they recorded a tune of mine called These Days. And he took it to Scepter and they said, we love you, Michael, and... God bless you with what you're doing. And I'll tell you what, we'll give you a two single deal. You can make 240. We'll put out 245s of the group. Um, no money exchanged hands. Mm-hmm. It was just that they were going to manufacture these 45s and send it out as Scepter Records. They, um, so the first record did nothing. And Michael came to me and said, I don't know what to do. He said, I, I, I don't think the label has any idea that the group is on the label. The, PR, the promo men don't know of the group. He said, I, 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 get, I have one more shot to make a single. What do I do? And I said to him, well, I would record a song that gets banned. And he said, why, why would that be a good idea? I said, oh, well, if it gets banned, uh, there will be controversy. <laughs> and you can go to another label, not Scepter, and say, this is that group that would have had a hit, but it was banned. They're all talking about this. And, and maybe you'll make a real deal with a real label. It's the only way to get anyone to notice it. He said, will you write a song that gets banned? And I said, um, yeah, I'll try. So um, there was nothing you could say at that time about sex that went beyond a certain limit. So it couldn't be that. 
uh, drugs, I wasn't going to be either an advocate or, or write something, you know, into in, encouraging anyone mm-hmm. to use them. So I didn't I couldn't think of what it, this subject would be that and it had to be, by the way, just tolerable enough to get played enough that it could then be banned. <laughs> if I wrote a song <laughs> which had the title that Gilbert gave to the actions of my heroes in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's going to release that, that as a single. Not, that's not going to come if up. If you wrote a song called Martin and Lewis used to fuck each other there, up the ass. You're getting, you know, yeah. you pick up on these things so quickly. <laughs> um, so, so, so I'm sitting down, and at that time, I was doing an arrangement of, a, of, of the Tennessee Ernie Ford classic 16 Tons uh-huh. for an artist named Andy Kim with the, the producer being Jeff Barry. Sure, you know Andy producer. Kim. Rock me gently. There you go, right? Sure. So I'm getting to do some arrangements, and I'm sitting with my guitar. Now, I've seen the movie suddenly last summer, about a week earlier on TV, and that has a certain nuance to it at the end. I don't want to give away anything, but that's sort of in the back of my head. Now I'm working on a... A s- arrangement of 16 tons. In the next room, in the kitchen, the TV is on, and the TV is playing The Galloping Gourmet, starring Graham Carey. Remember, so, remember sort that. of like sure. the, the Liberace of, of cooking you remember shows. Remember The Galloping Gourmet? The, oh, Galloping yes. Gourmet. A big, yes. That was a big thing. So he's in the next room spouting off ingredients. And I'm doing 16 tons, and I go, Some people say a man is made out of mud. A coal man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bones. Um, I said, it sounds like a recipe. Muscle and blood and skin and bones bake in a moderate oven for three hours and topped with Miracle Whip, you know, or something <laughs> like that. So I thought, wait a second. Cannibalism in a mining situation. <laughs> of course. <laughs> that might do it. That's hilarious. So I write a song about three boys who are trapped in a mine. And it goes, and I'm using, and I use the exact same feel I was using for 16 tons. Not the same chords, but the same feel. And I go, trapped in a mine, what had caved in? And everyone knows the only ones left was Joe and me and Tim. When they broke through to pull us free, the only ones left to tell the tale was Joe. Significant pause, and me. (laughs) (laughs) Timothy, Timothy, where on earth did you go? Timothy. So in the story, it's 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 the classic thing of uh, as in Spellbound, as in the movie Mirage, where the narrator knows they've done something terrible, but they don't know what. Hungry as hell, no food to eat. And Joe said that he would give sell his soul for just one piece of meat, water enough to drink for two. And Joe said to me, I'll take a sip and then there's some for you, Timothy, Timothy. Uh, Joe was looking at you. Timothy, Timothy, God, what did we do? I must have blacked out just around then because the very next thing that I could see was the light of day again. My stomach was full as it could be and nobody ever got around to finding Timothy. Well, we put out this record and it starts to go up the charts two digits a week. And what happens is that radio stations start to play it. It has a good groove. The kids like it. And... um, and the radio station, the DJs aren't listening to it because they're smoking a cigarette while the record's playing. And they suddenly catch and they say, wait, what is this song about? What? The, what? This is a, <laughs> they ate him. <laughs> so they, and they pull it off the air. And the kids call in and say, why did you pull the song off the air? And they say, because it's disgusting. <laughs> and, and that, if you want to tell a kid not to listen to a song. Of course. It's the, so the kids start clamoring for it. And it went inched up the chart. Scepter says we've got, we're trying to b- break the new Dionne Warwick single, but there's this record out there called Timothy, and they're saying it's on your own label. And it's just rising by its natural. Just, and we got to 17 on, in Billboard. And we, the reason you have never heard it, Gilbert, is no station in New York, no reputable station would ever consider playing it. So it, you, to hear this song, you would have had to be in the Deep South, Florida, you know, Midwest. That was where it was a hit. And we could never... But the wonderful thing was Scepter made up a rumor, oh, artificially. Oh, that's great. To try to get that last, those last stations to play the record and get it into the top 10, they said, oh, Timothy's a mule. Right. <laughs> It's such a cop out. It's so funny. It's it's almost like uh, springtime for Hitler. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. People think, and and, and look, I I at no point in the lyric ever suggested that cannibalism is a thing you should try. (laughs) 
you know, <laughs> just maybe just once, but try it. You know, live. Uh, it was it was a story song, a macabre story song, and the the truth of it is lurking in between the lyrics. You find it, you puzzle it out. Oh my God, is that? And it's been done a lot, but I get a lot of heat um, for writing the worst song ever written. But it wasn't badly written. It was no. well executed. It was just that the topic was unacceptable. Um, and yeah, so at no point did I really write a love song involving cannibalism. But I, what I do, I have to give that kid credit that I had knew no one in the business, I was and just I gonna tried say. to, I tried to think of how can I from this room do something that will get a, this group to get noticed. It's pretty canny for, yeah, for a was, guy who was just out of his teens. To, 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 to figure out what is the niche of what I can say and can't say and how could it be controversial and how could it uh, uh, raise an uproar. So well, We did our seven, 1971 Hit Wonder show. We did a mini episode and we just we got angry mail from people who say, how could you not include Timothy? <laughs> so there you go. To those people, here's the story. And, I, you know, I remember that now, this is just getting back to something you said before. I remember the first time on TV that I saw suddenly last summer, Montgomery Cliff and right. Catherine sure. Hepburn. Sure. That freaked me out. <laughs> yeah. And I'm someone raised on monster movies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That totally freaked That was me truly out. horrifying because yeah. you're saying that this was not monsters. This was what people do under certain circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so as we alluded to in the intro, Rupert, in rapping, you know, where, you know, where, you know where I'm headed. Uh, there can only be one destination. <laughs> my, here's my favorite my, quote. My, two, my, are you going to tell about? Oh, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that the, the, how you see, you're, you're fond of saying things like, uh, "For all that you've accomplished yeah. in your career, that your tombstone is going to be what? In the shape of a giant pineapple." <laughs> I love the fact that you had to sing the Pina Colada lyrics to get on a plane because you didn't have an ID. I didn't have an ID, and I actually did the song, and they <laughs> and they the, insanely accepted that as ID. It's, I love yeah, that. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. This was before sad events. Sure, sure, oh, sure, sure. Before we get to that, Nate, you're a monster fan. I'm, uh, I'm a fan of many things, and monster movies and horror movies is one of them. Okay, so what are some of your favorites? Well, I I. I fell in love with the Hammer, all the Hammer. Films. Oh, you like that stuff, the Christopher Lee. Well, I love the gu- I love the uh, the set dressing, the, mm. the, the that one they bought. I love the fact that they bought themselves a mansion, and every movie, it's always that same uh, uh, oh, mansion. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the 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 I love all the Universal incarnations of uh, uh, Frankenstein, Bride of, Son of. Ghost of yeah. meets the Wolfman. So much fun. House of they're just that original Mummy is so good too. Oh, the the yes. first Mummy, Carl Freund. That for, well, yeah, yeah he yeah. was on his own plane. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. that stuff. And, and he went for a little walk. Yes, you should have seen his face. <laughs> Fabulous stuff. And and Carl Freund, both the Mummy and the original Dracula, did this trick where the eyes light up. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, back then they didn't have the special effects. I think they actually just shined two lights they would do in that. their eyes. Yeah, I, I found yeah. an interview with you. I, if I have this right, where you were in some movie theater in Syracuse and you were seeing a, a Roger Corman double bill of yeah, but I was running Mask a of the fever, Red Death. But I was I saw a double bill of Mask of the Red Death and Tomb of Legia. There you go. And I was written running, by Robert Town, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Corman. Yeah, ex- in those ex- days. He would, sure. like many of the people that I got to meet, he exploited, <laughs> he exploited the best. Very oh, well. yes. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. I love- we, we had both Roger Corman and Bruce Dern. Oh, I would have loved to. Yeah. And and we also had, ah, fuck, watch me forget his Joe Dante. Uh, no, no, the actor. Oh, we had Dick Miller. Dick Miller. Oh, yeah. wow. Bucket of Blood. That's, Who, yeah, Bucket of Blood. In, yeah. In, in, with Dick Miller in the terror. The terror. Because nobody 
He said he admits he and the people who wrote the terror have no idea what the plot of course of this movie absolutely was. walk on the beach walk on the beach yes. for long <laughs> periods of time and then the castle gets a flood and everyone dies and dick miller basically at one point he's got this in totally fucking insane scene yeah. where he has to dramatically explain what has been going on in the movie, and it makes less sense. Let, when let, he, let, <laughs> you know, I always feel like he was reading it off a, like a teletype. Yeah. Or something. It was just coming yeah. in. Of the, yeah. Here's what the, the, you, your, your listeners, if they don't know, The Terror is this incredible film. If I get this wrong, please correct me. But uh, uh, Roger Corman was making what? Comedy of Terrors, I think? Uh, he came. One Roger, of them, the Raven, maybe? Raven, the yeah. Raven. Uh, anyway, he came in early. This never happens in movies. Yeah. He came in early and slightly under budget. Which has never happened yeah. in the history of filmmaking. You're always running late and you always run over. Sure. He had like three days left. So he said, we'll make another movie. Uh, and yeah, the, I think uh, and yeah. we have Karloff under contract and we have Jack Nicholson under contract. Yeah. And so they made a movie in three days called The Terror. Correct? That's the Which one I talking. think it was. Was it The Terror that he only made because it was raining and he couldn't play yeah. tennis? He was. He had, <laughs> he was he had the sets to play up. tennis with some of his friends. Right. There was a rainstorm, and he said, all right, we'll make a movie today. <laughs> I've got that right, right? <laughs> I'll, I mean, I'll yes. send you a link of our interview with Roger. It's That's, a lot of fun. Yeah. And by the way, if you had Bogdanovich on, um, when Bogdanovich m- made Targets, oh, sure. he, part of the stipulation was that he finish out Karloff's, Karloff's contract, contract you bet. which was still not all – he hadn't earned – worked enough. And I think he demanded that he also use – Outtakes, but I don't know if it was it was the flooding scene, but I don't think that's from the terror. It is it's it's the thing where it opens with the Karloff film and then Karloff they pull back and Karloff turns to the young filmmaker and says it was a very bad film. Yes, now I can't remember. Shame, anyway, on, shame on me. So so love that stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. How, how, well, can, I'll have you back next time. We'll just talk about what you know, you're you're the ultimate movie buff. Next time we'll just talk about horror movies. And, yeah, we can do that. And your love of uh, of, of bogey and and, yeah. and all of that stuff. Absolutely. Wow. Because I know you. Oh, which which brings us to there's your segue. Bogart's one horror film. Dr. X, the mis- return of Dr. Yes, X. The return yes. of Dr. Okay. X. Okay, not where, bad. Where Bogart's in like... He's got that like, streak. He's got a skunk-like yes, streak in his yes. hair. Yes, <laughs> He's like, like, uh, uh, yeah, and he's got like white makeup on and a white streak in his hair yeah. like a David Bowie. Wait a minute, the, ama- the amazing Dr. Clitterhouse was no. not a uh, horror uh, film? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Always wondered about that title. Yeah. Well, you know, Bogey gives us a segue here. Okay. Uh, uh, Rupert will know where I'm going. <laughs> Are you up for being tortured by... Uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Here we go. I don't have a, mu- a, a lyric sheet for talk, you. I think... Talk about the ultimate horror. I, th- <laughs> I, think you're, I think you're good. We queued this up. Frankie, uh, the story of this song has been told many, many places. It had to do with Martin and Lowe. No, but it... <laughs> no, no. No. <laughs> Rupert's, Rupert's going to tell us how it had something to do with Bogey originally. Oh, my God. Very good. I, I, for real? You want me to... I, do yeah. you have time for yeah, me? Yeah, we're going to gonna sing, but you could tell us that you can you can tell us quickly how it how the I'll have to changed. tell you very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what you have to understand is I had a track for which I had no lyric. How that happened is an entire story that we would have to do another time. We'll do it. But Next but time. but um, I had it was the night before I had to record the vocal on a track with a pre-existing melody, but I had no lyric, and so I wrote a lyric at one a.m. and went to the studio. Uh, to sing this lyric. And the chorus went, if you like Humphrey Bogart and getting caught in the rain. <laughs> there you go, Gil. Oh, Original lyric. Wow. And uh, you, you think sometimes about how your life, for better or for worse, can hinge on something you did like that. Yeah. And we've all, I'm sure, had moments where we said, if I had just gone there, I wouldn't have. Been. Did your life ever change because of a momentary decision you made, Gilbert? Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was it was when when I was on tour with Martin and Lou. <laughs> I was I was referring to Twitter. <laughs> oh my God! Oh, yeah. Yes. All right, but, but okay. go on. All right, back to so, Rupert. So I'm standing on mic. I'm about to sing the song, and and I've got the lyric in front of me, and I think now this couple in the song they're looking for an escape because the title of the song was Escape. Mm-hmm. There was no, and. Um, I said, I've done so many movie references. I just, maybe that's getting a little, you know, a little too monochromatic here. It's just, 
so what this couple, what they want is to get away from their the, their normal lives and, uh, and, and, and sort of as if they were on a vacation in the islands. And I thought, well, when you go to the islands and your first day of your vacation, you would never order on the beach a Budweiser. You would never say, I'll have a Budweiser. You always want to have something that demarcates the fact that you are officially on vacation. You're in the islands. So I thought, what are the escape drinks? And I thought, Mai Tai, daiquiri, pina colada. <laughs> I'd never had a pina colada in my life. And I said, let's see. If you like Humphrey Bogart, no. If you like pina coladas, I said, okay, pina coladas. And five seconds later, we rolled tape. And every time I looked at the lyric and it said, Humphrey Bogart, I sang pina coladas. And which caused me to then later add a kind of tropical instrumental break in it to make you feel like you're in the islands, which I would never have added if it had been about Humphrey Bogart. So the song eventually, the label came to me and said, you know, you've written this song about people asking for this song about pina coladas. And you call the song Escape. Can we put, make it Escape parenthesis, the Pina Colada song? And I said, compromise my artistic integrity. And they said, <laughs> they said yeah, well, it won't sell. I said, okay, it's the Pina Colada song. So it, it just that that one switch um, changed the fate of this song. Changed film. everything. Yeah, and a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, I, want to, I want to hear this sterling rendition. <laughs> I don't know how far you guys want to go with this, but Frankie? This is a karaoke version. Yeah. yeah. This isn't mine. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right, here we go. <laughs> I apologize. With that shame. <laughs> I was tired of my lady. We'd been together too long. Like a worn out recording of a favorite song. So while she lay there sleeping, I read the paper in bed. Personal columns. I'm laughing because I know what's coming up. Yeah. There was this letter I read. Take it. If you like being a colada <laughs> and getting caught in the rain, if you're not into yoga, if you have half a brain, <laughs> He's all slow. if you like making love at midnight, pick it up, Gil. Didn't think about my lady I know that sounds kind of mean But me and my old lady Had fallen into the same old dull routine So I wrote to the paper <laughs> Took out a personal ad Try not to laugh you Sound great And though I'm nobody's poet I thought it wasn't half bad I'll tell you what half bad is Yeah <laughs> <laughs> my and getting caught in the rain I'm not much into health food I am into champagne I'm gonna meet you by tomorrow noon And cut through all this red tape At a bar called O'Malley's Where we'll plan our escape <laughs> You do the last part together, Gil. <laughs> but don't drown Rupert out. <laughs> so I waited, waited with high there. hopes. <laughs> you come at the and end. she walked in the place. <laughs> I knew her smile in an instant. I knew the curve of her face. It was my own lovely lady. And she said, oh, it's you. Then we laughed for a moment And I said I never knew That she and might be in your And getting, and getting caught, caught in the, in the rain. rain And the and feel of the ocean And, and the, the taste, taste of champagne If you like making love in the night, night In the, the dunes on the cape, cape. You're the lady I've lived for. Come with me and escape. 
and in the category of song ending career. <laughs> the nominees are. Wow. <laughs> career ending songs. Career ending songs. Oh. Oh Lord! Well, oh. I, it's safe to say, I've, I've, it's never been that way before. <laughs> and uh, and uh, now I, you know how Jimmy felt when he did Wichita Lineman. He did w Wichita Lineman, yeah. one of the most beautiful songs ever written. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's oh, not anymore. You know, you ca you dream of these far. things. You dream of these opportunities. <laughs> I remember when uh, when Bud Abbott said, "If you if you ever cared about any of our films, just put a dollar in an envelope and oh. mail it to me." And uh, you can you is can this reach that me. Moment? Yeah, this is that moment. <laughs> oh um, no, it's come to that. Yeah, um, oh. Gilbert. Uh, you know, I've 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 um, I've always treasured your voice, and yeah. to think that to think that I just put words in your mouth and yes. that you were doing my. It's I, I. It's all been building to this, really. He sang with Paul. He sang Rainbow Connection I'm with so... Paul. He sang Richard Tall Lineman with Jimmy. Wow. What else? What what how, what did I miss? Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, Don. Uh, well, oh, what did I sing with Ron Dante? Sugar, sugar. Oh, oh you did yes, sugar, sugar. Yes. Oh, and a, oh, that would have been good. And I crushed a version of the locomotion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just crushed it. <laughs> I'm. Uh, I'm usually. I usually have something to say, but I. I have to, I have to tell you. I never saw a guest blush this yeah, much either. Yeah, it's really. I, um, I, I, Gilbert's a hero of mine, and it, it's you know kind of like I don't know Mickey Mantle saying, uh, "Let me play basketball with you." <laughs> you know. Um, just, Maybe you might have been better off with your chiropractor. <laughs> oh. In retrospect, oh. that was great, Gilbert. Thank oh, you for doing that. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. I Rupert. believe ASCAP actually gets a... I have to give them money back now. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I owe them. Uh, tell us what's coming I'm, up. I want to donate the royalties of this to a charity that he has just created by virtue of the damage he's done. <laughs> What's what's yes, what are you working on now? What's what's happening? With the, I got I have an ice cream truck that I well, operate. You, is, I, is Dorian Gray happening or the have, Marty musical? Yeah, I'm, or? I'm Marty musical. We're doing a, a reading, a very interesting reading of that with uh, some major people. I can't announce them because um, uh, they're still being it's being negotiated. I'm it's writing okay. a new musical um, with. Uh, Sir Trevor Nunn at the helm, wow. the director, uh, based on uh, the life of and work of Andy Warhol. And I'm writing a new musical with um, uh, Mark Holman, who wrote You're in Town, uh, based on a wonderful book about the 1955 Do Brooklyn Dodgers called The Boys of Summer. Oh, sure. Roger Collins' book. Yeah. That's a great book. And I am finishing, as even as we um, uh, speak, uh, finishing the first volume in a new series of novels I'm writing for Simon & Schuster, which are pretty, um, if you think cannibal cannibalism <laughs> is bad, uh, these are um, self-help guides for murderers. Um, called um, uh, it's a hands-on hands-on guide to homicide. The first volume is called uh, "Murder Your Employer," and uh, <laughs> my guess is that it will people will buy it just to leave a copy on their desk at work. Oh, that's fun! So it's it's actually a very fun book. It's, I can't describe it in short time. But you are busy. I'm. I, you You're know, always busy. You're keeps always... me off the streets. I don't have to wear the electronic anklet, <laughs> and uh, and it's what America. Well, I'm going to tell our listeners to pick up a uh, cast of characters, your collection. Do we call still call it a box set? It is these, a box set. These days. Yeah, yeah. And also the two albums, Partners in Crime and Widescreen, that I love. And well, we didn't even get into you working with Will Jordan on... Uh, we got to talk about that. Oh, next time yeah, we have I, you back, Will we'll Jordan talk about... And Ed Hurley. And Ed Hurley on, yeah, uh, yeah. on Psychodrama. Psychodrama, yeah. And that is a wonderful record. Uh, and uh, you are a brave soul. <laughs> no, no. This was this was as much fun as I've had uh, in a decade, and that only tells you tells you how absolutely miserable my life has been. It just you know. Will you tell us about being on the Joe Franklin show when you I come will. back? I okay. will indeed. We'll, yeah. have, we'll have you back, and we'll just bullshit about movies. Absolutely. Okay. And you you wanted to tell us something about Dean Martin and Jerry. Lewis. Yeah, you know. <laughs> let's you know. It's so good. Let's save it for another show. <laughs> Why don't you put that somewhere where Dean Martin would put it? Okay. <laughs> do you know? Do you know what uh, the cent? Uh, what, what do they call it? A centenary? The hundredth uh, hundredth birth of Dino? He was in, he's next month, June. Such a class. Yeah, hundred years. I've gotten into some big debates with people over who we love more, Sinatra or oh, and well, I can't even talk about that. There's another project on the horizon. That, okay, that, that's kind of and exciting. next time, there's plenty we didn't get to. Good. You talk about Frank Jr. and yep. yes, I will. Song Blue, Old Blue Eyes didn't do. Yeah. never yeah. got to, and yeah. all that cool yeah. stuff. 
Thanks, you, guys. I've had a lot of fun. You were a fun guest to research. I could go for hours. Oh, thank you. A lot of stuff. I used to say that to people, too. <laughs> <laughs> just, in, just, and in, in any of those musicals, is there a small part for Gil? Uh, <laughs> there, there's, there's a big part for him in a very small musical. <laughs> okay, okay. No small talents. So... I'm Gilbert Gottfried, and this has been Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and we've been talking to uh, David Weinstein. <laughs> Goldstein. <laughs> Goldstein. David Weinstein. <laughs> Goldstein. David Goldstein. Thank you. Thank I'm you. sorry. That's quite We've been right. talking to David Goldstein. <laughs> you forgot to say where we were. Oh, at Nutmeg. Yes. With our engineer, Frank Verderosa. And I want to thank our mutual friend, John Murray, oh, for, intru- John, for making you. the introduction to you. And by the way, a marvelous, marvelous A marvelous musician Truly. who has done terrific work Great guy. on, this, I'm a on fan. this very show. I'm an absolute fan. We yeah. love you, John. Rupert, this, is a, this was a blast. I enjoyed it. Okay, man. Rupert Holmes, ladies and gentlemen. Jew. <laughs> <laughs> I am the strings that enter softly Or three guitars The glitter gold I am the thousand trumpet lines That were an afterthought Intended as a way to get a dying record sold I never ride the road I never play around